one of the one of the big questions that people ask, and we spoke a little bit about last week, when we spoke about lush and hara, about bad tongue, about using the right words, <clears throat> is are small lies justified? Right. You know, is it today's section that we're going to read in the Siddur, page eight <laughs> in the Siddur, <clears throat> which has the prayer. God, protect me from false testimony. A false testimony, that's where we're up to. Last week we did malicious tongue, slander, right? Today we're going to do what? Protect me from false testimony. And that means from <clears throat> saying bad things, wrong things. Obviously, we want to be, protect ourselves from people that speak false testimony against us. But more importantly, we're trying to protect ourselves from bearing false testimony. So part of that is lying. Right? Lying about other people is being false testimony. Now, being false testimony, before we get to big lies, small lies, is, 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 is not one of the small things in the Torah. Being false testimony is where? Where is that in the Torah? The prohibition against, right, right, Helga? It's in the Ten Commandments, right? It's in the Torah. The Torah, there's Ten Commandments, and... Um, the ninth of the Ten Commandments is <clears throat> Do not speak up on behalf of your friend as a false witness. So we're not allowed to be false witnesses. We're not allowed to be a false testimony. So it's as close as we get to not to lie. Obviously, bearing false testimony has implications when we go to court and we speak. You know, we say... Uh, uh, we speak about someone else in court. As we know, it's a big mitzvah. One of the big mitzvahs of the Torah is to, to be a, a witness. Now, a person can say, I don't want to be a false testimony, so I won't be a witness. No, you're not. That's not either good. The Torah says that if you if you, if you witness the crime, <clears throat> you have an obligation to go to court and to be your testimony. And if you don't go to court, you carry the sin. And in fact, if somebody, let's say, saw how someone else lent someone else a hundred bucks and then they can't collect it, and they, they need a witness in court and you don't go to court, you're really responsible for the hundred dollars that you made your friend lose. Sometimes it could be a matter of life and death. You don't bear testimony just to save your friend from from being put to death for, for a crime they didn't do. <clears throat> so that's one of the big mitzvahs of the Torah is to go and to bear testimony, to say what you saw, to say the truth, clarify the truth for all to know. And if you don't, don't do it, what's the grounds for that? The grounds for that is love your fellow like yourself. Also, if your friend loses an object, you must return it to them. So the same thing is if if someone has, you have something that they can benefit from, like testimony, that is included in returning a lost object. I don't know if you ever heard that one. And then there's also the Torah says, and you shall not stand by idly. You must bear testimony. Right? People that saw things in the Holocaust or even now at 10-7, must be your testimony, not for ourselves, even for the world. You have to tell the story. You have to tell what we saw. You can't keep it to yourself. Not many people are afraid to go to court. Go to court, it's a headache, it's a problem. Why am I going to go to court and you know, get myself into trouble and headaches? No, no, that is a moral thing to do. Once you, you're, you have to be your testimony, so the Torah in the Ninth Commandment says, Thou shall not bear false testimony. Since you are, you have a mitzvah to tell testimony, make sure it's, it's true testimony. And it's it's so important that it's one of the top ten commandments. Not to bear, not to tell a wrong story. So yes, you have to go to court, but you have to be careful what you say. Yes, you have to tell the story, but whatever you say, be careful with your words. <clears throat> make sure it's accurate. 
and you don't spread nonsense around the world, tell true stories. And we see today from what's going on in social media, how it's so easy to change things and not to tell the truth. You just say things with a different nuance, with a different tune, with a different story. There's so much of it going on, right? Saying things out of context. <clears throat> Bearing testimony of things you never saw, you just heard from others. So some people come to shul and they tell, say, oh, I know a fact that this happened. I didn't know it's a fact. What do you mean? I heard Yankel say it online. I heard Rabbi Plotkin say it. <laughs> Not Rabbi Plotkin saying it. Then. But Rambam says, or Maimonides says, about the prohibition of bearing false testimony, how severe it is, and what does it mean to bear false testimony? Bearing false testimony means, testimony means something you saw. You're an eyewitness to so you can't come to court and say, I saw something when you heard it from someone else. That's not testimony. That's bearing false witness as well. If let's say your rabbi came to you and said, Moshe, Sarala, trust me, I'm the rabbi of the shul, but I tell you a lie. I saw this happen, but I don't want to go to court. You know, I'm a rabbi. You go to court for me. And you tell them that you saw it. And I'll give you all the details. I'll tell you exactly what happened, what time, what happened. What happened. I, you know, I'll tell you exactly the crash, exactly where and when it happened, and exactly where you scraped the car, and where the guy scraped the car. You just come and say, I saw it. That is considered bearing false testimony, even though more than likely the facts are correct. It's not a testimony. It's just you're giving over from someone else. The Torah says, what is testimony? Testimony means two things. One is that you saw it, and the other thing is that you know it's the truth. Because even if you saw something, it's still possible it wasn't the truth. And maybe you didn't see it in context. You saw someone giving someone $100, right? You don't know whether it was given as a loan, or maybe it was a repayment for another loan. So you can't come to, to the court and say, I saw them giving a loan to each other. You have to say, I saw, stay with me. one said to the other, this is for a loan. And you heard that. Oh, then, then you have the facts. Even just seeing something is not necessary. It can be out of context. A lot of people, they see things from, from the Middle East today. And they see, they see like a little movie clip. But it's out of context. They just show you a part of the story. You didn't really see the story then. You saw a part of it. <clears throat> so you need to know, A, that you saw it, B, it should be accurate. Okay, but that's mitzvah bearing false testimony, which is one of the big Ten Commandments. But a, a subsidiary of that is also not to lie. And this is something we spoke about. This is a question I asked at the beginning of class. You know, can you tell small lies? What's a small lie? Small lie is <clears throat> you bump into someone you haven't seen in years. You say you exchange pleasantries. You say to each other, ah, hello, how are you? I haven't seen you since, uh, since uh, 20 years, right? So nice to see you. And uh, and then, and then at the end of the conversation, you say, oh, you know, it's so exciting to see you. Um, I'm going to come circle back to you. Uh, I'm going to come back to you. And you have no intention ever circling back to this person. <laughs> you met them, it's fine. It's enough you met them the one time. You, you have no intention of seeing them again. <clears throat> well, a lot of times people say, see you later. So that's just a, a, a statement we make. We don't plan on seeing the person ever again, but when you say, I'm going to circle back to you, I'm, I'm going to get back to you, right? Kind of thing, right? <clears throat> That's a small lie. Well, there's many other little lies that we, we say in the in the course of the of the day. 
small little things, you know, that we tell we'll tell a person. Um, you know, you bump into someone and you say, uh, you know, you're wearing the nicest suit I've ever seen. It's such a great suit. <laughs> it's an ugly suit, but, you know, it comes from uh, uh, short people, right? Short people store. No. <laughs> He's a tall guy. He's wearing a short man suit. It's not nice. But, uh, but you say, oh, what a suit. You have the nicest suit, right? It's going to be nice, right? Try to pander the person or give, give, gain credibility, right? So, I mean, it's a harmless lie. What's, what's you know, what's a lie over here, you know? Just saying something nice about the person. <clears throat> and then we have other kind of lies. I mean, the, the, obviously, there are some serious lies, like obviously lying, lying on your on your taxes, uh, you know that's that's a, that's a real lie, right? Or lying on your on your uh, saying saying that that somebody scratched your car and they never did. And those are real lies. We're not talking about those kind of lies. We're speaking about now little small little lies. Are they okay? Now we're gonna we're gonna speak about a whole whole series of different kinds of lies, but they're all a form of false testimony you're saying false things about something you're seeing so they are in a way false testimony as well and we say every day in the morning we say god spare us from false testimony i mentioned last week that in the torah on the one hand it, it's very severe about lying it says in the torah it says in leviticus it says you shall stay far away from lies. Not just not to lie, but stay far away from lies and liars. Stay far away. It's an extreme statement. <clears throat> but here we have it. So there's a question. So in the, in the Gemara, there's an interesting story that's related about a famous second century rabbi. The name of this rabbi was Rav. He must have been such a good rabbi that everyone called him Rav. He was like the Rav. Rav. He was one of the greatest rabbis that lived. He was a Rav, rabbi in a city called Sura in Babylonia. The Jews were already in Babylon. And the Rav was one of the biggest rabbis that lived at the time. That he was called Rav. I'm not even sure what his real name was, but he was known as Rav. And Rav, we always find he argued he, had a, he, had a, he was the head of the yeshiva and surah. And in that very same era, there was another rabbi. There was a rabbi, I think, in Nardoa, another city, and his name was Shmuel. Rav and Shmuel. In the Talmud, you always have Rav and Shmuel. Now, you hear that bell in the background now. It's a, a fire alarm. I'm just going to go check whether it's for real. More than likely, it's just a, a, a fire drill. But I need to go check. Otherwise, it'll get very hot in this room. So let me just double check. I'll be right back in a second. <laughs> thank God. Thank God the building is in good shape. Everything is good. It's just a, a drill. The, the kids have a drill every every couple of weeks or something for, for a fire drill. So that's good. It's good. Everyone's safe. So I'm telling you the story of Rav. Rav was the rabbi. It's a second century, third century rabbi in, in, in Babylon. And he was the head of the school and everything. So Rav had a bit of a problem with his wife. The Talmud records that uh, <clears throat> Every time he would ask his wife for uh, for soup, he loved soup. Whatever the rabbis, rabbis like soup. Who Jackie Mason says everybody likes soup. You know everything else. People, yeah, I'm in a mood, I have a headache. I, but you ask somebody, would you like soup? And who, who says no to soup, right? Everybody likes soup. Right? That's Jackie Mason. Anyway, so. Rav used to like soup. 
And but what happened was with his, with his wife, every time he asked her for for some pea soup, she gave him lentil soup. And whenever he would ask for lentil soup, she would give him pea soup. So there was a major communication problem. Either she needed a hearing aid, in those days they didn't have, or maybe, maybe she was a little confused. Who knows? Whatever he would ask, she would give him the opposite. He asked for lentils, she gave him peas. He gave him peas, lentils. So his son, who was also later to be one of the great rabbis, Rabbi Chia, Rabbi Chia saw this problem, this communication problem going on. So he tells his father, Dad, let me let me take care of it. Maybe if I, I speak to mom, you tell me which soup you want, and I'll tell mom, and I'll make sure you get the right soup. And sure enough, he started telling his son Chia what soup he likes for that dinner. And Mrs. Rav would, would provide the exact the right soup. Rav would tell his son Chia it's lentil soup. He got the lentil soup. He told his son Chia pea soup. Got the pea soup. Is this a story recorded in the Talmud? Yeah. So he went to his son and he asked him, What's your trick? What's your trick? So he told him, Dad, my trick, I would, whatever you wanted, I would tell mom the opposite. So if you wanted the lentil soup, I told the pea soup. So you ended up with the lentil soup. And if you want the pea soup, I told the lentil soup, she made you the pea soup. I mean, you got always the right soup. <laughs> so he just, he just flipped it around. He knew she always mixed it up. Maybe she didn't know what lentils were, what peas were. I don't know exactly how it worked. But the Rav says, I'm sorry, but, but it, it's a good idea. But the ends don't justify the means. You still shouldn't lie. You have to tell the truth. Right? So even though you, you're getting me the right soup, so the ends are good, but the means are not justified. Because a person should never lie. And uh, there's a rabbi, uh, one of the middle-aged rabbis, Rabbeinu Yoyna. Rabbeinu Yoyna is a famous <clears throat> uh, writer of, of many ethical works. So Rabbeinu Yoyna writes, the reason why it's, it's still not a good idea to lie, even if the results are good, right? He writes because a person has to be careful not to lie even small lies. Because when you lie little things, eventually you lie in big things. In other words, if you live a life of lying, even if, if you have good reasons for it, it's not a healthy thing. You, Taki, you want to get the right soup, and you know the lie is going to end, end up going to get you the right soup. But training yourself to lie it eventually you know and that's how thieves crooked people start they, they don't start with big lies start with small lies little lies if, if, if in your daily life you're busy lying first of all you know the ganif gets so confused he keeps on lying and lying you make more lies and more lies and, and, and then the whole life is a big lie. You know? Some people live their whole life as an existence of a, of a series of lies. The truth is one truth. So you can always remember the truth. It's easy. Stick to the truth. And you're always good, right? But once you start lying, you're lying this, you're lying that, and you have to make sure all the lies work out. <clears throat> I remember there was a guy over here that told his wife, when he got married, he told, he told her that he, he's a doctor. Told his wife he's a doctor. He thought he'd get a good shidach, you know, get a good good wife. So then for the rest of his life, he had to he had to make believe he was a doctor. So he used to go out to, to, to Hamilton every day and, and go there and say he was a doctor. Then in our in our in our nursery school, his kids thought he was a doctor. So there was a day we used to invite all the people who were who were like uh, uh, community helpers. 
So the kids used to ask their dad, dad, come to, to the school and, and be the doctor for the day. So he would come with his, with his, with his, with his, with his stuff. But he wasn't a doctor. They found out 20 years later, this guy was never a doctor. <laughs> you know, sometimes people they, they make lies and they live their whole life with one lie, another lie. But then eventually he catches up to you. And he says sometimes prisoners are happy to go to, go to jail. Because they've they've done so many lies and so I have this guy, he's uh, this guy this this week they're revealing 150 people that he uh forget the guy's name, he's he was a, a Jewish crook over there that, that that he cooked how many people 150 people were involved in his that in sex uh, scheme, whatever it was. Uh so 150, and one of them was a president of the United States that he, he used to service. But he was a whole existence of, of stories and lies, hiding for people, and it's not a good way to live, right? So that's in a more severe way. But uh, but for us simple people, we don't we're not severe liars. We don't lie generally, but but we get caught up in little lies sometimes. Sometimes we just say lies. Why not? Tell a little lie. What can a little lie hurt, right? So the Baini Yena says that if you start saying little small testimonies, false testimonies in life, you tell a little bit false lies, eventually it destroys the, you know, they had a scientific study. I think it was in 2016. They found that they, they, they checked out the brains of of they, they did cat scans on, on people who are liars <laughs> i can imagine this this uh this sort of test you know it's like a scientific test they say who wants to who wants to volunteer the liar that wants to go into into the cat scan and to see the brain they did mris on brains of people and they detected in the medulla of the brain the medulla is is, is the part of the brain that that has the uh, fear you know, like that's the basic. The medulla is the is the brain stem. That's the basic human instincts where we 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 have certain underlying fears that we have, right? Like we don't want to commit suicide. Uh, we want to live. Just basic uh, instincts of the human being. So they found that there's an area about people being embarrassed to lie. They don't want to lie. There's something about instinctive in a person, not to lie, to say the truth, right? But they found that 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 the that the uh, people who who did small little lies in their life, that part of the brain shrunk. It became desensitized. By by many little lies, it desensitized the brain, and so we lose that instinct of of not lying. Right, so that's what Rabbeinu Yehuda said six hundred years ago. He wrote that the reason why Rav told his son, "Don't say little lies." The reason is because you do you start with little lies. Eventually, you'll, you'll say big lies. One thing leads to the other, as the Pirkei Avot says, "Avera koreret avera." One sin leads to another sin, and and the the the, the Pirkei Avot says. A small sin can lead to a big sin too. So I'll, in the right way he speaks about Aveda, Gerera, Aveda, the one sin leads to another sin. He says, and do not look at a small sin as being small. It's the little ones that you have to watch out for. Don't think that it's little. And you could explain that, that maybe little sins are really big sins, or you could explain, no, the little sins, they eventually lead you to the big sins. So when you say little lies, Boom. Now, I, I want to make a little caveat to this whole thing that I'm telling you. There are sometimes justified little lies, according to Judaism. Judaism is not like, it's not like the Germanic belief that you're not allowed to say any lie whatsoever. I think it was Nietzsche or whoever it was, in the big, the big, the Germans, you know, the Germans, they had to say the truth. You know, they're very accurate. With it. But that was part of their philosophy. I think it was Nietzsche that said, if somebody comes into your house 
and he's about to be killed by a murderer, and he's hiding in your house, and the murderer asks you, is this person in your house? You have to say, yes, he is in the house. You understand that? Because you have to say the truth. The truth is more important. In Judaism is not necessarily that way. There are sometimes overriding factors. Life and death. You're allowed to say a lie if you're going to save someone's life with that. That's not what we're talking about over here. But we we're talking about inconsequential lies which, which desensitize the soul. Those are, stay away from, Rabbi Yoyna says, stay away from those things. Sometimes there are certain times there's a need to lie. It says that, 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 that Aaron Akoyan, Aaron the high priest, was beloved by the Jewish people, the entire Jewish community, mourned for him for 30 days, even more than Moses, because Aaron Akoyan was known as a man that would bring peace between a husband and wife. And the, the Talmud tells us, well, what, what was it? how did he bring peace between a husband and wife? Husband and wife were, 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 were in a squabble and a disagreement. So what would he do? He'd run into the husband and he'd say, you know, I just spoke to your wife. She says she wants to make up. And then he'd meet the wife. He said, I just met your husband. And he told me how much he loves you. And then they both meet each other and, 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 and embrace. So that's a white lie for the purpose of shalom bias. Now, so that's, that. as Jews, we say, there are overriding factors. So sometimes there is a greater cause which allows for a lie. That means to save a life, to save a family. Then we're allowed to, to, to lie for those purposes. But just to lie, that's unhealthy for the soul. Just to say things, you know, like uh, that are wrong, uh, even though they're inconsequential, not good for the soul. Not good for the soul. When there is a, a, a reason, then maybe yes. A serious lie, obviously, to bear false testimony, no good. To uh, to, uh, to 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 say, you know, to, to cheat on the taxes or to cheat on 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 our, our on our, uh, you know, not to not to tell the truth when you when you're going to to be in a car accident or whatever, that's not good. That's wrong. Likewise, he's the Rabbi Yenis says, and the, the Talmud says, even small lies are, are things which stay far away from lying. It says, But there are certain times in Judaism we believe that there are higher principles and lower principles. So sometimes a lie can be said for a greater cause, for bringing peace between a husband and wife, for saving a life. They're allowed to lie. Are you with me, Hebra? So today's lesson is that we say every day, Hashem, please guard us and protect us from false testimony, from bearing false testimony. That we should never be tested. And we should never go and, and say false testimony in the court, but not even in court, amongst other people. We tempted sometimes to say stories, to say lies. Be careful with our words. Be careful not to say Lush and Hara of last week, right? Spare us from Lush and Hara and from those people that speak Lush and Hara about us. And the same thing is also to be truthful. Emes. Very important. It says that the insignia of God is Emes. At the end of the Shema, the last word we say is Emes. Shem Elokechem, Emes. God is Emes. Very important. Now, I want to say something else about bearing false testimony is that we know that Jews, we are the God's, God says about the Jewish people, Atem Edai, you are my witnesses of my existence and of my message to the world. Jews bear testimony for God. If you give a look at the Shema Yisrael, it says, God says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. All right? If you look carefully at the uh, letters, how it's written in the Siddur and in the Chumash and in the Torah. The words are Shema Yisrael, Hero Israel, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. <clears throat> the last letter of the Shema, Shin Mem Ayin, the Ayin is like a large letter. You look in the Torah or any Siddur, the Ayin is large. And the last letter of the, of the Shema, Echad, 
One, one God, the Dalid is also large. So there are two letters in that sentence that are big. What are the two letters? Ayin at the end of the word Shema and the Dalit at the end of Echad. Why those two letters? Because Ayin Dalit is aid. Aid is witness. So the Jews have a mission to bear witness of God to the world. So how are we the witness of God for this world? Why are the Jewish people a witness for Hashem? In numerous ways. One way is because we were the people that merited to see the presence of God at Mount Sinai. Torah says, Eneichem ra'avolayzar, your eyes, the Jewish people, you saw me reveal him by myself and tell, say the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. It says the Jews, they saw it, which was heard and heard, which was seen, but we experienced it. We had a clear visual experience of God at Mount Sinai. The only nation as a nation that had it. So therefore the Jewish people, we are the witness to God's presence and God's revelation. That's our job, to be aid, to be a witness. There's another group, they call themselves something witnesses, right? That's where it comes from, the idea, to be witnesses, witnesses of God. But the Jewish people particularly, we are the witness, as it says in the Shema, aid, we witness God. But another explanation you could say is, why are we the witnesses of God? It's because we are the only people that survive forever. We have this God-like survival power. It's beyond anything in the else in this world. If you want to see, when you want to find God in this world, find the Jewish people. No one else, every other nation is temporary, comes and goes. The Jewish people, we have this survival instinct that's beyond we are a minute minutiae of the whole world, and they're always ganging up on us, the United Nations, time and again. They all want to destroy us. Try, try, try again. But somehow, we just live on. <laughs> we survive. Yes, at a great cost. And it's very hard to be this survival nation. But we are the witnesses of God in this world. Maybe that's why they hate us so much, because we are those witnesses, and people don't want the headache of hearing about God and, and about morality and decency and menschlichkeit and all these things that Jews stand for, even though we don't, some of us don't even know we stand for that. But that's what we stand for. They want to wipe us out. But we are witnesses, and therefore the Torah says, do not bear false testimony. Ah, it means as being a witness, we have a responsibility. We can't be false witnesses. We have to be real witnesses. We have to, we have to live up to what Hashem demands of us. We have to be people of integrity. We have to be people that say the truth. We have to be MS and not give up on telling the story of God to the world. Because there are some witnesses always that say, I don't want to get involved. I'm not getting involved. No, no, that's not... You, you have a moral responsibility. If you have information, you cannot withhold the witness, the testimony. And the job of every Jew is to walk out on the streets and shout out Hashem, shout out Torah, shout out mitzvahs, shout out decency, morality, shout out menschlichkeit, shout out that there is an order in this world. It's not a jungle. That's our job. Because we heard it and we saw it. It's all included in do not bear false testimony. And it's all included every morning we say, God, save us <clears throat> from false testimony. Because we want to be true witnesses to Hashem. And by telling our story, please God, we have peace in Israel. And the world will hear the real story, the true story, the story of the Jewish people. And may we merit to an end of all the tsarists, return of all the hostages, Return of all the soldiers and an end to the wars. And uh, no nation shall raise swords to each other. You won't have any more war. There will be no more war. There will be no more tzodes. There will be no pain and suffering. Coming Mashiach to the Anyone have any questions? Any questions, anybody?
Thank you, Rabbi. Shalom. Shabbat shalom. Thank you, Rabbi. Everybody. Thank you very much. Thank Rabbi, you Rabbi, yeah, I, I, I feel oh, Sonia. Uh, you, you reminded me that I lied a uh, number of times in the um, communist country. Yeah. Um, I remember very well. I was about eight or nine years old and I was at home and somebody rang the bell and I went and there was a gendarme standing there. They used to wear, Helga, you probably remember, leather coats and they looked certain look. He came and asked, where is your father? I said, I don't know. When is he coming home? And I lied. I said, I don't know. They were at that time a gathering all the Jews. It was in 1953 and 54. Yeah. I was a small girl. Mm -hmm. And I lied. Mm -hmm. The other lie was that um, when there was a Rosh Hashanah or Jewish holidays, in my whole school, there were, I didn't know, but there were about five Jewish children. Mm -hmm. And my father had a friend doctor, and he signed for us little slips that we are sick. Mm -hmm. And um, we gave it to our teachers. And um, my teacher was very suspicious. She called me aside. And she asked me to extend my hand, and she had a ruler in her hand. And she said, were you really sick? How sick you were? What was happening? And each time I said, yes, I was sick. She slapped me on my hand with the ruler. I came home, and I had really blisters on my hand. Wow. So those were a few of my lies. Yeah, the, the fact so I, should, you... I should worry about my medulla. Yeah, you may do it. But let me tell you like this. First of all, I, first of all, I explained before that those are both were justified lies. But the second, the second point, which is the most important, the fact that you can remember two lies in your life, that means to say that that's the only lies you ever told. Right? That means you remember the two times in your life that you said a lie. It means that a lie, a lie doesn't pass your lips besides the, those two lies. And the other thing is those those like I said before life saving things for 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 protecting people for for higher causes you, as Jews we believe that you are allowed to lie you know that's that's we don't we don't say that you have to lie not lie at all costs but at the same time the Torah says stay away from lying as much as you can even little lies inconsequential lies don't lie but I didn't lie good enough because. Uh... A few days later, they came and got my father at work uh, at uh, when he was at home. Right. And we didn't know about him for about three days. And my mother was walking the street and we were trying to, a uh, few of the Jewish community trying to find out. I was right. at hours, went to watch from the window. Then three days later, there was a black, it, it was called Tatra Plan, the car that only mm police used and officials right. and they threw him on the uh, in front of the house on the curb and he was bleeding so they beat him up wow. so I didn't lie enough yeah well, everyone tries the best they can in life and that you should have no regrets because you did what you had to do or the best you could do then as a little girl so don't don't feel don't have any regrets because you did when you're dealing with these kind of evil people which we are experiencing now as well you know those those kind of people you never win with completely so you try the best you can anyway thank you everybody have a shabbat shalom shabbat, shabbat shalom, shalom. Okay. shabbat shalom thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shabbat shalom everyone shabbat shalom